Mike Winger is a well-respected Christian teacher and host of the Bible Thinker online ministry. Mike has produced several videos which not only seek to defend PSA, but argue that it is historical and central to the Christian gospel. We strongly disagree and believe it is necessary to present a sincere and well-reasoned counter-argument for both Mike and his followers to consider. We do not want this disagreement to be a source of division. Both Bible Thinker and Idol Killer are dedicated to Christ and the truth of Scripture. It is our hope that this will serve to mend divisions and bring the body of Christ into a deeper love and understanding of the goodness of God. Well, hello and welcome to Idol Killer, a ministry dedicated to destroying sacred cows for the cause of Christ. I'm your host, Warren McGrew, and we are joined once again by Paul Vondrady as we continue this series responding to uh, Mike Winger and some of the claims he's made regarding penal substitutionary atonement, or PSA for short. Uh, Paul, welcome back, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing great. These are always fun, so thanks for having me back. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad to have you back. I love the jacket, uh, and you're looking you're looking dapper. And I think with that, let's let's just jump right into this and and see where today's episode is going to take us. Warren, the Reverend Mister Winger assures us with the utmost confidence that the church fathers teach PSA. In order to substantiate this, he cites 14 patristic sources. Those sources are, in alphabetical order, Ambrose, Athanasius, Barnabas, the Epistle of, Basil of Caesarea, Chrysostom, John, Clement of Rome, Cyril of Alexandria, Diognetus, Epistle of, Eusebius, Gregory of Nazianzus, Hilary of Poitiers, Ignatius of Antioch, Justin Martyr, and Origen. I recommend when we confront this kind of claim that we do what we did last time. And that was our William Lane Craig experiment where we ask, if Proposition P is true, then what would we expect to see? In this case, we're dealing with a proposition and a general observation. The proposition is, the church fathers taught PSA. The general observation is the Eastern Orthodox Church lives and breathes these church fathers. Let's put those into our formula. If the church fathers taught PSA, then we would expect the Eastern Orthodox Church, which lives and breathes these church fathers, also to teach PSA. In reality, the Eastern Orthodox Church teaches neither PSA nor anything even faintly resembling it. Therefore, the Church Fathers do not teach PSA. Obviously, that inference pattern is not going to convince Mr. Winger or any of his partisans. If we wanted to convince him that the Church Fathers don't teach PSA, we would probably have to go through those 14 citations in excruciating detail. You pointed out in the first interview, we simply don't have time to do that. We have to take only a handful of these church fathers and look at them. Today, we're going to look at Athanasius. Excellent. Yeah, right. thank you for that. Um, you know, it, it when you're when you're presupposing that the early church fathers taught an atonement theory, and you read their their writings, it's very easy to unknowingly bring that bias forward into the text. Very easy to do. And uh, and so I don't think that uh, Mike is doing that intentionally, but I do believe he is bringing that bias into the text. And as you noted, the Eastern Church, who live and breathe the early church fathers, um, they don't hold this, this view of the work of Christ. And so that does raise the question, why? And I think it's a, a reasonable question to ask and you're right, it probably isn't going to convince someone who's died in the wool 100% committed, but it is it is one of the points that we're going to raise in conjunction with all of these others that really starts to build a cumulative case and show a robust response that, no, this is, this is not an ancient view of the work of Christ. This is relatively modern. You're right. It's not an ancient view of Christ. It's modern. And I think that neither of us is surprised to find that Mike Winger is trying to paint Athanasius 
as if this fourth century figure is some atonement preaching proto Protestant. It just you want everybody in church history to look like you. So that that affirms that you're right and everybody else is wrong. Well, that's a fundamentalist idea, and it's a false idea. It's not. There's nobody that can honestly look back in history and find that everybody looks like them. That kind of thing is standard operating procedure in the apologetics industrial complex. Here's what the Protestant apologists are facing. The Protestant apologists claim that Protestantism represents the true teachings of Christ. The fly in that ointment is that the birthday of Protestantism is October 31st, 1517, meaning the origin of this movement is at a 1500 year remove from the birth of Christ. It is not an attractive proposition for any apologist to have to defend the claim that everything from the book of Acts up until 1517 happened during a time of undifferentiated demonic darkness. So the tactic that the Protestant apologist uses at this point is to jump onto the timeline at 1517, turn backward, and then look down the corridor of Christian intellectual history, seeing what he can illegitimately plunder therefrom. So what happens is the first person they run into in this intellectual journey is a guy named Thomas Aquinas. This is a figure who is towering over the intellectual life of the late medieval period. So the Protestant apologist takes his brush and immediately starts brushing Thomas Aquinas as a proto-Protestant. But Aquinas is more of a Protestant than he is a Catholic because he denied and even pronounced uh, as absurd or irrational or illogical, uh, certainly false, basic Catholic dogma held uh, de fide, as ex cathedra statements today. Well, what Norman Geisler was referring to, I think a little bit of that might have gotten clipped off, is the idea of the Immaculate Conception. So, you know, he's saying that um, Thomas Aquinas rejected the Immaculate Conception, and therefore this doctor of the church is not technically a Catholic. You know, interestingly enough, Anselm also rejected the Immaculate Conception, and he too is a doctor of the church. But this is a Protestant strategy to take some figure who's living, leading a monastic life, which Martin Luther condemned, and say, hey, this guy leading a monastic life is a proto-Protestant. So what the apologist does from this point is he continues backward down the timeline of intellectual history, and he comes to the late antique period. And the figure who is towering over this era is a guy named Athanasius. This is the one that Reverend Winger says is a guy who believes in PSA. And we're gonna see this paintbrush job happening also in this clip. Rather than finding O'Brien's idea that scripture is not a safe guide as to what we are to believe, Athanasius said, quote, for the tokens of scripture are more exact as drawn from scripture than from other sources, end quote. These other sources included church councils, such as that of Nicaea, which Athanasius defended strongly. And he also said, but since Holy Scripture is of all things most sufficient for us, therefore recommending to those who desire to know more of these matters to read the divine word, I now hasten to set before you that which most claims attention and for the sake of which principally I have written these things. And he also said these words, and I believe exactly as he for indeed, the holy and God-breathed God scriptures are self-sufficient for the preaching of the truth. Now, how did that Protestant end up in the church so long ago? Speaking of Dr. White. Yeah, there's quite a difference between what he said in the previous two clips that we played of him. Yeah, little, 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 a little difference. Yeah, I have to speculate on what that could be. Um, the, I mean, there's an obvious disconnect between the audio clip that we just played and then the two video clips that we played in the uh, first two interviews in this series. In order to understand why there's a difference, a person has to understand the era in which those recordings were made. 
The two video mm -hmm. clips that we watched came from 2022. That's just a few months back. The audio clip that we played came from the 1990s. The 1990s and the 2020s are two completely unlike eras. In fact, just to give you an index of how unlike that era is from the day we're living in now, that recording came off of an audio tape. Does anybody remember what an audio tape is? That's right. I you mean, had to bust out the pencil if you wanted to, to rewind it and re-spool it. I remember those days, yes. Exactly, and these things got eaten up on a regular basis. I've got a whole number of tapes that got eaten up. You know, these things rattle when you shake them, but you can teach yourself Esperanto, Warren. <laughs> But the, the point of it is this, the, in the era of the audio tape, the apologetics industrial complex could send out apologists to do debates or give speeches, and the apologist could lie with impunity because the audience did not have cell phones in their hands. Consequently, they couldn't check out the references on the fly and verify whether they're being told the truth. When the apologetics industrial complex sends out an apologist now, that guy is aware that everybody has one of these, a smartphone. On the fly, anybody can check any kind of reference that's made in a debate or in a speech. And if the apologist has lied in the speech or lied during the debate, he's going to be in big trouble when the audience Q&A session starts because somebody's going to go, hey, wait a minute. You said Gregory of Nyssa said blah, 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 blah. Well, I've got his great catechism open right here, and you are a liar. So that kind of thing is uh, quickly going away in the world of apologetics. And I have to say that the apologetics industrial complex has been dragged kicking and screaming into honesty thanks to technology. Yeah, and to, to a large extent, you're right, because back then... There, there was no fact, fact checkers. You know, you weren't able to just go uh, as a lay person and find the entire work of an early church father on a on a on a website somewhere and 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 call them out on it. You had to spend big money to to go and buy the the printed volumes, and you couldn't just carry those around with you wherever you went for reference sake. So you really were at a disadvantage whenever you were engaging with someone, you had to take them at their word, or uh, at the very least, you would have to go back and try and find it later. And but you're right, that's that's a big problem. And, and I think um, the advancement of technology, which enables programs like this, and like Dr. White's current program, um, are, are doing wonders for uh, the, the dialogue within Christianity at large. Because while you're of the Eastern uh, Orthodox, I don't, I don't, I'm not a member of the Eastern Church, but I, I love my Eastern brothers. I don't consider myself a classical Protestant. I'm certainly not a, uh, a member of the, the Roman Catholic Church because I, I deny Augustinian anthropology. But yet, because of the availability of information we have, if we are both like-minded and committed to the truth and we're trying to get to a point, we can find great uh, agreement on these things because the facts are the facts. And uh, and if, if we're committed to the truth, we're going to we're going to arrive at, at similar conclusions, although, like we've noted, sometimes bias does does occur. And we've got to be on the lookout for that. Yeah, that's extremely well put. I mean, probably I wonder if either of us would be doing this in a previous era because we are living in the Jetsons back in the 1990s, which, you know, technically is not that long ago. If I wanted to look into the church fathers. I had to go to the priest's office during the pitiful hours he was in the office and ask, hey, can I please, please borrow that copy of, of Athanasius? So he would reach on his shelf, take down the big green Erdman's book and hand it to me. And, you know, the thing, too, is back then, as it is with any church library, about a third of the books are missing and never return. They just grow legs and walk off. So, you know, even all the church fathers weren't there. But, you know, we're living in the Jetsons, thank goodness. Now we have CCEL.org. A person can go down there and download every single copy of the Schaff series on the Church Fathers, either on PDF or even on a notepad file. 
you can have in two seconds, you can have all of Athanasius on your computer and transfer it there to your mobile device. It's just an amazing time we live in. Anybody can read the Church Fathers. They are widely available online for free. Yep. And the only thing the only thing that they don't come with is your particular set of presuppositions. So we've got to be good stewards and good Bereans, both of Scripture and their writings, to try and understand the points they were conveying rather than bringing our own bias to the text. But you're right. It, it's, it's amazing that we have access to this today. So since we're on the subject of presuppositions and Athanasius, let's address the statement that Mr. Winger makes that Athanasius is teaching PSA, Substitutionary Atonement. As I said, this happens all over the place in Protestantism. And you know, what's really surprising is this right here, like no other man, this is a booklet written by a Calvinist PhD and medical doctor named Alex Metherell. What's really surprising is when you look in the back page at the bibliography, where he lists the Christian classics on Christ and his atoning work, he cites two works. One of them is Cur Deus Homo by Athanasius, or by Anselm, sorry. No surprises there. Anselm is the originator of PSA. So, of course, he would be citing that. But the next book that, that Metherell cites is On the Incarnation by Athanasius. That's this book right here. I leaned very heavily on that book when I did my series critiquing penal substitutionary atonement. So we have to look at it. How is it that a Protestant and an Eastern Orthodox can look at the same book and come to different conclusions? Well, I think we're going to have too much material to wade through. So what we ought to do is narrow it down just to what Athanasius says about the crucifixion. Because according to the atonement school, the crucifixion is where the atonement takes place. Then again, suppose without any illness he had just concealed his body somewhere, and then suddenly reappeared and said that he had risen from the dead. He would have been regarded merely as a teller of tales, and because there was no witness of his death, nobody would believe his resurrection. Death had to precede resurrection, for there could be no resurrection without it. A secret and unwitnessed death would have left the resurrection without any proof or evidence to support it. So what we just heard from Athanasius there is that Jesus had to die by crucifixion because crucifixion is a public death. And because it's public, that means that Jesus could not fake his death, and then afterwards the apostles would stage manage his fake resurrection. So in other words, this is something, he, he dies by crucifixion, in order that the resurrection can have verification. We're going to move on to another reason why Athanasius says that uh, Christ has to die by crucifixion, and this comes from On the Incarnation, section 24. Some might urge that it would surely have been better for him to have arranged an honorable death for himself, and so to have avoided the ignominy of the cross. But even this would have given ground for suspicion that his power over death was limited to the particular kind of death which he chose for himself, and that again would furnish excuse for disbelieving the resurrection. Death came to his body, therefore, not from himself, but from enemy action, in order that the Savior might utterly abolish death in whatever form they offered it to him. A generous wrestler, virile and strong, does not himself choose his antagonists, lest it should be thought that of some of them he is afraid. Rather, he lets the spectators choose them, and that all the more if these are hostile, so that he may overthrow whomsoever they match against him, and thus vindicate his superior strength. What Athanasius was just telling us there is that Christ is like a boxer. The champion in the world of boxing has to fight all of the top contenders. If he refuses to fight the top contenders and just pads his record by fighting bums, no one's going to think very highly of that boxer. So Christ has to die a shameful, extremely public death, extremely painful death, in order to show that he has the stuff to overcome that kind of a death. If he overcame an easy death, well, then people would not be so impressed. I want to point out just how practical of a response that is. How, how simple, practical, and strikingly obvious it is that, that Christ would need to die a public death 
it, it just it just it just makes sense. It, it does. I mean, am I am I crazy here? It does. Doesn't it resonate that is that it would just if if you're going to die, and you don't want there to be any question about it, it would be out in the open. It would be visible. Everyone who would see it would be able to attest to it to serve as a as a witness to remove any doubt. That just makes sense to me. It's a beautifully sensible and simple answer, and it doesn't involve any kind of machinery of penalties and substitutions. So, you know, when we put those two things together, the idea that he has to be killed in public to prove that the resurrection is not fake, and he has to defeat an ignominious death to prove that he's got the stuff to defeat the ignominy, all of that goes to prove Christ's divinity. And isn't that one of the big things that Protestant apologists are always arguing for? Isn't this why they always lock horns with the Jehovah's Witnesses? It's over the divinity of Christ. And in these very streamlined, beautiful answers, Athanasius has showed us that's why Christ died by crucifixion. And if I may move on, the yeah. second reason why Christ has to die by crucifixion is to destroy the power of Satan. Even so, he foretold the manner of his redeeming death. I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto myself. Again, the air is the sphere of the devil, the enemy of our race, who, having fallen from heaven, endeavors with the other evil spirits who shared in his disobedience both to keep souls from the truth and to hinder the progress of those who are trying to follow it. The apostle refers to this when he says, According to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that now worketh in the sons of disobedience. But the Lord came to overthrow the devil, and to purify the air, and to make a way for us up to heaven, as the apostle says, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. This had to be done through death. And by what other kind of death could it be done, save by a death in the air, that is, on the cross? Here again, you see how right and natural it was that the Lord should suffer thus. For being thus lifted up, he cleansed the air from all the evil influences of the enemy. I beheld Satan as lightning falling, he says, and thus he reopened the road to heaven. Now, Warren, what we had there was a very clear instance of what's called the Christus Victor model. Christ is killed in the air because the book of Ephesians tells us that that is Satan's domain. He is the prince and the power of the air. So Christ defeats Satan on his own turf. Again, Christus Victor, not penal substitutionary atonement. Finally, Warren, uh, Athanasius gives us a third reason why Christ has to die by crucifixion rather than by some other means, and that is so he can serve as an icon. He serves as an icon of two things. The first thing that he, show, he is an icon of is an icon of human unity. That's what we're going to hear in another quote from section 25 of On the Incarnation. How could he have called us if he had not been crucified? for it is only on the cross that a man dies with arms outstretched. Here again, we see the fitness of his death and of those outstretched arms. It was that he might draw his ancient people with the one and the Gentiles with the other, and join both together in himself. So what Athanasius has told us is that Christ has his arms outstretched in crucifixion to symbolize his drawing all men unto him. How many men? All men, Calvinists! Not just go. a select elect few. All right, so he's an icon of unity, an icon of dying for all men. So much for limited atonement in the church fathers. All right, now the, the second thing that he is serving as an icon of is indivisibility. We learn about this when we go back to section 24 of On the Incarnation. Therefore it is also that he neither endured the death of John, who was beheaded, nor was he sawn asunder like Isaiah. Even in death, he preserved his body whole and undivided, so that there should be no excuse hereafter for those who would divide the church. In other words, Christ has to die by crucifixion rather than by beheading, because beheading or something like that would be an inappropriate symbol. It would show the head being divided from the body, and Christ is the head of the body of the church. The church is indivisible, which is why Christ dies by crucifixion. So if we review, Athanasius has told us that um, Christ dies by crucifixion, 
not because it's the most horrendous death and God has to exact his pound of flesh in the most horrendous means possible, but rather because it proves Christ's divinity, it destroys Satan, and finally it serves as an icon of indivisibility and unity. These opinions, these views, these redemptive uh, uh, articulations of the redemptive work of Christ, um, it, it doesn't take a whole lot of of follow-up questions going, well, what does this do to the father-son dynamic? What does this do to the divinity of Christ? What does this do to the holiness and justice of God? You know, was it the humanity? Was it the, it does, it doesn't seem to bring in all of the, the subsequent problems, which I'm sure we're going to raise in the, as we continue on in the series, but their explanation, it, it seems to be, um, and I'm, I'm a lay level uh, individual here, but it seems to be less clunky. It seems to be just really straightforward, simple, easy to understand, no clunkiness, no wrench, no appeals to mystery, just this beautiful display of God's love and redemptive work in, in the person of Christ, fully God, fully man. There you go. To quote the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Exacta Mundo. I have always liked Kawabunga. <laughs> now, after we have listened to those very eloquent citations from Athanasius, we come now to the typical Protestant understanding of why Christ had to die by crucifixion. The first person we're going to turn to in clip 3C is the celebrated Protestant systematic theologian, Wayne Grudem. Now, the question that comes up at this point to some degree why this sort of death that is why didn't jesus die by you know uh, a, a soldier just striking him with a sword and uh, and he would die or 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 some other kind of quick uh, death rather than one that was so so agonizing and was so prolonged i don't think the Bible explicitly addresses that question, but I am going to suggest something. And that is, I think that it may be that Christ's death was so, um, was so hard and, and there involved so much suffering so that we could see how destructive sin is. That is, so that we could see in a stark, shocking portrayal the effects of sin taken to its ultimate conclusion in a human life. And God created us to be beautiful or handsome or attractive in the way he created us. But um, Isaiah 53 talks about the fact that he had no beauty, that we should desire him. And and his face was marred and, and distorted by the punishment. And isn't that a picture, that sin leads to a loss of, of beauty or attractiveness or desirableness in life, and sin is ugly, and, and its beauty is a lie. It, it has no beauty, ultimately. And so there was a picture of the consequence of sin. So, Warren, when you see a cross, do you think of sin and ugliness? Boy, I, I, I see brutality on display. Christ was brutalized. Um, I see suffering. I see all of the things that are related to mortality. I see everything related to, to death. Um, I don't I don't see um, I don't see God's wrath being stated. Uh, I don't see God's wrath on display there. Um, of course, I, I read all of uh, all of that passage of Psalms in context. I don't just begin with "My God, My God, why have you forsaken me?" I read the whole the whole the whole passage, and I see that He has not turned His face, but when He cried, He heard Him. Um, so I don't I don't view it in in this sense of of PSA. What what how 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 would an adherent? I've, I've been so far removed, Paul. So far removed, it's hard for me to see PSA anymore here. Help me, help me see what the PSA adherent is seeing here. Well, we can just contrast what Wayne Grudem said with what Athanasius said. Athanasius said that 
Christ dies by crucifixion in order to be an icon of indivisibility and unity, human unity. By contrast, Wayne Grudem says that he has to die this horrible death so that he can be a icon of sin and ugliness. Mm. And I think we get an even more colorful enunciation of that when we listen to clip 3D. This is R.C. Sproul. And I said, but I particularly like the word obscene. Because that's what the whole drama of atonement is about. It is dealing with the obscenity of human rebellion against God. And I doubt if there was anything, in fact, I'm sure there was nothing that ever appeared on this planet that was more obscene than Jesus of Nazareth when he hung on the cross. Because at that moment in space and time, Christ had gathered to himself and put upon himself the sum total of all of our sins. And after he had taken upon himself our sins, every filthy thing that we've ever done had been imputed to him, he was the quintessential obscenity. So mm. Christ is the quintessential obscenity. I mean, I don't know how anybody can hear that and not um, be convicted in their spirit and say, I mean, RC, that's, that's blasphemous. I mean, it, you know, I don't, I don't use the, the B word. I don't use the H word uh, lightly, but, but to, to hear RC's articulation of, of Christ on the cross in his beautiful, beautiful display of love and selflessness and redemption and rescue and to say that this is obscene, um, it, 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 it stirs something in my spirit that just makes me angry. And, um, but I'll, I'll, I, again, I mean, I don't, I don't want to speak too ill of, of Sproul now that he's no longer with us, but uh, it is, it's, it's an offensive statement. It's totally unbiblical, too. I recall in the Gospel of John, Jesus said, For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him everything that himself doeth. Mm. What? The Father what? He loveth the Son. He doesn't hate the Son, doesn't pour out his wrath on the Son. They have perfect communion. They have perfect communion uh, all the way through the crucifixion, the resurrection, etc. There is never a time when the Father and the Holy Ghost are dissevered from the Son. It is one perfect triune unity. And as we're going to look at in a later interview. And, and now, now you do you do bring up a good point here. And maybe I'm cutting you off ahead of time. Maybe you're about to address this. But it, it seems it seems like the, the, the model of PSA causes significant division within the, the triune nature of, of God. So instead of having the Father and the Son and the Spirit of the same nature, character, essence, uh, it, it seems like Jesus can say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, but the Father can't. He's, he's got he's mm -hmm. to punish. He's got to vent. He's got to do something. So it seems like this is creating that that division. I'm sure we're going to get more into that as the series progresses, but it, it doesn't. It doesn't seem like the early church fathers held yeah. this sort of um, oppositional view within the Godhead. Yeah. It was. It was always God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working of the same mind, same purpose, same goal, unity, and that is because God so loved the world, He sent His only begotten Son, and to redeem and to rescue, and that's why Christ was here. It wasn't because the father and son were at odds or that this penal substitutionary language needed to be accomplished, but it was because God came in a single mind to love, to redeem, to rescue, to heal. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And that was a very splendid homily, by the way, we ought to get you into preaching. <laughs> but, you know, the problem is I don't have the beard for it. The, the Eastern Orthodox, they won't let me because my beard's too short. Well, I mean, it's about the length of Bob Larson's beard, so you could at least do that. Ooh. But uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. The church fathers understood that to mean that Christ took upon himself the damaged human condition in order to heal it. When the atonement school reads 2 Corinthians 5.21, they think it means that Christ becomes literal sin and the embodiment of a curse. On the tree became gossip. On the tree, he became a slanderer. Did he slander? No, he became it. 
He became insolent. He became haughty. He became boastful. He became an inventor of evil. Jesus became an inventor of evil on that tree. Jesus became child on the tree. Listen. Jesus became full of on the tree. Jesus became a thief on the tree. Jesus became addiction on the tree. Jesus became a hater of God on the tree. What does it mean for him to become sin? Jesus became lost on the tree. Jesus became Satan worship on a tree. Are you hearing me? So perfectly consistently with that theology, they say, well, now, wait a minute. God is of purer eyes than to look upon sin. That means if Jesus is sin, why then God can't look upon sin and has to turn his back on him. Well, that's a divided trinity. And yeah. Mike Winger stridently says, no, we don't teach a divided trinity. You're caricaturing us. I have got the receipts on that, and we are going to play those receipts in a later episode. For now, let me move on to clip 3E, and this is Wayne Groom again explaining why Christ had to die by crucifixion. So why did Jesus suffer this sort of death? Perhaps because it was in many aspects taking away of essential qualities of what it is to be truly human in the, in the excellence with which God created us. And it was portrayed in such a stark way, drawn out over time, so that that would be so firmly etched in our minds, this is what sin will do. And here Jesus is taking that penalty for us. God created us to be like him, to be in his image, to reflect his character. And in many ways we do that, but and, and that's the essence of uh, that, that those, those characteristics and ways in which we reflect God's character and we're like him, the, those show the image of God and they show what full, true, uh, beautiful, wonderful humanity was to be like. But many aspects of that humanity were taken away and the crucifixion in a way was an, an extensive dehumanizing of the person of Jesus Christ. Warren, can we use the B word there? Uh, I think we can. I think we can. Yeah, I mean, yet, goodness. Um, in, in, order, in order to maintain this view of Christ becoming sin, uh, in order to maintain this view of, of him uh, having all of our sin substance, sinfulness, and the guilt, all of that imputed to him, um, boy, do they cause some major problems. Uh, they, 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 they will preach what is essentially an ontological change in the divine nature of God when Christ is on the cross. Exactamundo. And Wayne Grudem is not alone in that opinion. I have in front of me again that little booklet by Alex Metherell that I heard, held up earlier. On page 17 thereof, he writes, quote, The degradation of Jesus' humanity on the cross is what glorifies or reveals his divinity, end quote. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Jesus didn't have to be degraded to be transfigured in front of three of his disciples. He revealed his divinity then. You know, this is just terrible theology. It, it, it's worse than that. As you, as, as we were agreed, it's blasphemy. Mm. Now, there's an additional problem with this. Uh, uh, Jesus is on the cross for approximately three hours, and Wayne Grudem is telling us that it has to be that length of time because it has to sear into the onlookers' brains mm. the idea that you know this is this is we've got to degrade Christ. This is a symbol of degradation. You know, that basically is what lies behind the, the, the mentality that gave us that movie, The Passion of the Christ, which in my opinion is nothing more than torture porn. This is a movie that insisted on showing all the brutality in all of its extremity because they believe that this is necessary to dehumanize Christ and this is necessary for our redemption. I would like to read from Mark 
I'm looking at Mark 15, verse 25. This is how Mark describes the crucifixion. And it was the third hour and they crucified him. That's all that Mark says about the crucifixion. He doesn't dwell upon the blood. He doesn't dwell upon the pain or anything like that. And you know what? I have a most unexpected ally in this particular argument, and that is R.C. Sproul Jr. By the way, God's word does not give us the verbal equivalent of two hours of pictures of the crucifixion of Christ. It says he was crucified. And that's all we need to know. Well, Warren, we can move on to yet another clip from Wayne Grudem. And this is where he's talking about why it's necessary that Christ be shamed on the cross. God created us to have honor as his stewards over creation and his representatives over creation as the pinnacle of his creation. But crucifixion was holding someone up to shame. It was thought to be shameful. Roman citizens could not be crucified. It was only those who were not Roman citizens on whom the Roman Empire allowed crucifixion to be inflicted. And it was being held up to public shame and disrepute. And sin does that. Sin brings shame, ultimately, not honor. All right. Well, Athanasius said that it was necessary that Christ die a shameful death as well. But Athanasius said, because that proves his divinity, because he's tough enough to overcome a shameful death. But Wayne Grudem just told us there that this is yet more of the debasement that God the Father is heaping upon his son. You know, it's, it's funny, too, because um, coming from a Protestant background, uh, we would always look at the, the predominantly the Roman Catholic crucifix. And I remember preachers saying, you know, look, he's not on the crucifix. He, he you know, he, he's not still crucified. He, he died and rose again. And they saw uh, the iconography of Christ on the cross as uh, belittling his victory. And yet the atonement theory is so predominantly focused on that. Um, and yet their view of the crucifix uh, with Christ on it is, is uh, it, it's, it, there's this tension. There's this uh, uh, inconsistency in the way that they view these things. And I don't think that, that they're very much aware of how over here we're showing the very thing that you say had to happen. And that's that's your redemptive, that's not even a redemptive model. It's your, that's your atonement theory is what happened on the cross. And that's the key focus. Um, <clears throat> but it, offend, it offends them if, if you see the icon. It, it, I just I thought that was kind of interesting and worth bringing up. That is one of many inconsistencies in atonement school thinking. Warren, we're going to go on to, I think this may be the last of our clips from Wayne Grudem. This is clip 3H, where he talks about the necessity of excruciating pain. God created us to be free from pain, having bodies that were healthy and, and strong. Um, but Jesus on the cross was filled with pain. And I think that reminds us that sin doesn't lead to joy. Sin leads to suffering and pain. And we're seeing a portrayal of the consequences of it. Okay, if we review what Rang Grudem has said, and this is in stark contrast to Athanasius, Christ has to die by crucifixion rather than by some other form of death because crucifixion is an icon of ugliness, because crucifixion dehumanizes the person on the cross, because crucifixion inflicts shame on a person on the cross, and because crucifixion is the most painful way you can go. That is not patristic thinking. However, since we're on the subject of pain, we have a much longer clip now of a Protestant going into excruciating detail about Christ's pain on the cross. This is the aforementioned Alex Metherell. Well, it began on Thursday evening after the uh, Last Supper. Jesus went with his disciples to the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there, if you remember, he prayed all night. Now, uh, during that process, he was anticipating the coming events of the next day and knowing the amount of suffering that he was going to go through, was going through a great deal of psychological stress. And as we're told, he sweat blood. Now, this is a known medical condition. It's called hematidrosis, very uncommon, 
but it's associated with a high degree of psychological stress. And it comes about because of breakdown of the capillaries in the sweat glands. And so there is a small amount of bleeding into the sweat glands so that the sweat comes out tinged with blood. We're not talking about a lot of blood here. It's just a very, very small amount. But what it does is it sets up the skin to be very fragile so that the next day when he was flogged by the Roman centurion, uh, the skin was very, very sensitive and fragile. And the flogging usually consisted of 39 uh, lashes, but frequently uh, was a lot more than that, depending upon the mood of the centurion applying the blows. And he would use a, a whip, which ha would have um, leather thongs, which had tied into them uh, pieces of metal, which when uh, the whip would strike the flesh would cause deep bruises or contusions. And it would also have uh, woven into it, into the braiding, uh, some sharp, jagged pieces of bone. And the sharp bone would cut the flesh deeply. So the, uh, the flogging was extremely brutal to the point where, in fact, probably uh, the bone itself uh, of the ribs and the, uh, the spinous process from the spine would be exposed in the deep, deep cuts. And uh, uh, many people would, in fact, die before even getting to the crucifixion. And uh, from the account that we read, it's evident the, that the whipping was particularly severe because he was not able to carry the cross to uh, Calvary, and somebody had to help him. And uh, we know then when he got to Calvary, he would, would have been laid down on the ground with the horizontal beam that had been carried there, and he would have had his hands nailed to the beam with his arms in the outstretched position. And the nail would look something like this, but instead of going through the palm, where a lot of artists and painters show it, it actually went through the wrist. We know it went through here, because this was a solid position that w would lock the hand. If it went through here when uh, hanging on the cross, it, the nail would tear through the palm and one would fall off the cross. So it went, went through here, which in the language of the day, this was considered the, the hand uh, as well. Now, the interesting thing is that this goes through a point where the median nerve runs, which is the largest nerve going out to the hand, and the nail would crush the median nerve which is something equivalent to uh, taking, uh, if you bang your elbow and hit your funny bone, you know how, how excruciating that pain is. Imagine taking a pair of pliers and crushing that nerve, the ulnar nerve, which is the funny bone. Um, uh, the, 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 the effect would be similar to that in crushing the median nerve going through the wrist. So the, the pain was absolutely excruciating. The word excruciating comes from the word out of the cross. The pain is so bad, the only description is the kind of pain one suffers in a crucifixion. Now, at the same time, he also had nails uh, 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 placed through his feet. And uh, uh, likewise, nerves in, in the feet would be crushed, and there would be a similar type of pain in, in the feet. And so the whole process is extremely painful. And then at this point, going up into the vertical position, because of the uh, loading on the arms, uh, the arms would immediately uh, be stretched probably about six inches in length, and both shoulders would become dislocated, which would fulfill the Old Testament uh, prophecy in Psalm 22, which describes the crucifixion, which says, my bones are out of joint. And um, once up in the vertical position, the process of death by crucifixion is essentially a, a death by slow suffocation because it is, it is difficult to breathe out while hanging with such a load on, on the arms. So it's necessary to push up on one's feet to, to breathe out. And in doing so, the nail in the foot would then tear through the foot, eventually locking up against the tarsal bones. And then one would breathe out and then be able to relax down and take another breath in. And this process would go on until complete exhaustion would take over and one wouldn't be able to breathe anymore. As one uh, slows down the breathing, uh, one goes into what's called respiratory acidosis. Uh, the retained carbon dioxide in the blood uh, is dissolved as carbonic acid, causing uh, increased acidosis of the blood. This leads to heart failure, uh, and the heart failure uh, uh, results in an effusion, a pericardial effusion in the sac around the heart. 
and there's probably also a pleural effusion in the, in the space around the outside of the lung. So that just before the point of death, uh, with the acidosis increasing, this would then lead to terminal arrhythmias in the heart. And at this point, Jesus knew that he was at the moment of death, which is when he was then able to say, O oh Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit, and then he died. Now, a short time after, the Roman centurion came ar uh, around and uh, uh, being cer fairly certain that Jesus was dead at this point, he confirmed it by thrusting his spear into the, his right side. And it was probably his right side, that's not certain, but from the description, it was probably the right side between the ribs. The spear probably went through the right lung and into the heart, into uh, either the right atrium or the right ventricle and puncturing the sac around the heart as well. So when the spear was pulled out, a clear fluid, the pericardial effusion and the pleural effusion, which was a clear fluid with the appearance of water, came out followed by a, a large volume of blood. And, and this is in fact what we see described by John in his gospel. So at this point, there was absolutely no doubt that he was totally dead. All right, so what Alex Matherell told us there is probably medically accurate and probably historically accurate. There's nothing wrong with it from that standpoint. My only concern is that this is inappropriately uh, devotionally. If we're constantly thinking about Christ and, and all these sufferings, it can take us away from the victory of the cross. But let me, for the sake of summation, go through what Alex Metherell said that Christ endured. So according to Alex Metherell, who is a medical doctor, Christ went through extreme psychological stress leading to his sweating and blood, which is called hematidrosis. Then he was flogged by the Romans, which exposed his ribs and spine. Then he had to carry the cross to Calvary and fell. Then he had his hands nailed, which crushed the median nerve. Then he had his feet nailed, which crushed the pedal nerves. Then his arms are stretched out, stretching his arms six inches on the cross, which dislocates his shoulders. Then he slowly suffocates, creating respiratory acidosis. Then he has heart failure, resulting in a pericardial effusion in the heart and a pleural effusion in the lungs. Then Christ suffers from terminal arrhythmia in the heart. And finally, a soldier runs him through with a spear. Okay, that is a lot of suffering. Now, according to the biggest name in the atonement school, R.C. Sproul, who did that to him? Cynical and skeptical theologians of our own age have called the biblical interpretation of the death of Jesus horrific in its understanding as it would involve nothing less than cosmic child abuse. And so the apostolic interpretation of its meaning, according to these people, must be rejected. Well, they're right at one point. At least they understand that the one who drove Jesus to the cross, the one who inflicted all of that pain upon him and torment, was no one less than God himself. Man, Paul, that's that's extremely problematic. I mean, look at look at Genesis 3:15 and the Proto-Evangelum. Who 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 are we told at the very outset of the messianic prophecy will be the one inflicting this upon the one who was to come? It was none other than the serpent or the serpent's agents. And yet we have RC Sproul and the atonement school saying, "No, no, no, it wasn't the serpent, it was God." It's blasphemy. Got to use the B word again. It is. It absolutely is. And, you know, I'm sure that people are ready to projectile vomit like Linda Blair at this point. But let's go on to one other problem in their understanding of why Jesus had to die by crucifixion. God created us to be in fellowship with him. But here Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The fellowship the beautiful fellowship that he had known with the Father from eternity uh, was temporarily disrupted so that 
there was a dehumanizing factor of loss of fellowship with God. And sin does that, doesn't it? It, it alienates us from God. And God created us to be in his favor and to have his pleasure and his joy and delight in us, but sin leads to an experience of God's wrath. And that's what Jesus experienced on a cross. Scripture tells us, but when he cried, God heard him. And yep, we, have Psalm Wayne Grudem, we have Wayne Grudem and R.C. Sproul saying, nope, 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 don't listen, don't listen to David, don't listen to the Bible. No, no, no. The reason Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? is because God forsook him truly. And I don't know if we're going to get to this clip or not, and it, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and note it here. R.C. Sproul, in one of his recordings, I've got it somewhere here on the channel, refers to Jesus as a disillusioned prophet. I want to wretch when I hear that sort of language. Um, it, it's, it's, it's horrendous. Warren, you just sprung something on me that I wasn't expecting. I thought that I had every audio recording that uh, R.C. Sproul made available to the public. I never heard him say that one. Because after he became the scapegoat, and the Father imputes to him every sin of every one of his people, we see the most intense dense concentration of evil ever experienced on this planet. Jesus was the ultimate obscenity. And so what happened? The Bible tells us that God is too holy holy to even look at sin and he cannot bear to look at this concentrated monumental condensation of evil and his eyes are averted from his son. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. The light of his countenance is turned off. All blessedness is removed from his son, whom he loved. And in its place was the full measure of the divine curse. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. All the imagery that portrays the historical event of the cross is the imagery of the curse. It was necessary for the scriptures to be fulfilled that Jesus not be crucified by Jews, but he has to be delivered into the hands of the Gentiles. He has to be executed not by stoning, but he has to be killed by Gentiles outside the camp, outside Jerusalem at Golgotha. So that the full measure of the curse and the darkness that attends it be visited upon Jesus. And God adds to these details astronomical perturbations where at midday he turns the lights out on that hill outside of Jerusalem so that when his face is moved away, when the light of his countenance is shut down, even the sun won't shine on Calvary. And bearing the full measure of the curse, 
Christ screams, Ailey, Ailey, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh, look at how the theologians play with that. Oh, well, Jesus was taking this occasion to identify with the psalmist in Psalm 22, which begins with those words, so that he can call attention to the, those who are looking upon this spectacle that this is really a fulfillment of prophecy. I don't think Jesus was in a Bible-quoting mood at that time. <laughs> or as... Albert Schweitzer opined, this was a cry of a disillusioned prophet who believed that God was going to rescue him at the 11th hour. And he felt forsaken. He didn't just feel forsaken. He was forsaken. For Jesus to become the curse, he has to be utterly, totally, and completely forsaken. Well, the stunning thing about all of this, Warren, is that young Mr. Winger says that all of this is a misrepresentation of PSA. Let's look at another one. I call this clip scoffing in malice. <laughs> How does this work? Does God say, well, look, I want to forgive sins, but I'm going to get paid. And I want an innocent life. That's a given. And uh, let's see, I want his death to be painful. Uh, crucifixion, that'll do. Uh, but I want some torture beforehand. I want there to be some lashes. Uh, you know, a crown of thorns, that would be nice. I want a crown of thorns. And we might say, how many thorns will be enough to pay the price? Ten? Oh, no, there must be a minimum of 19 thorns in the crown. Oh, man. Brian Zahn, I don't think you'll ever watch this. If you do, though, please, man, please stop. Like, your your rhetoric is is blasphemous. And um, and I know, I did a video, I dealt with Brian Zahn's content before, and he just laughed, he just laughed at it. And, and I get that, because um, you're so self-assured. But, but I'm saying if you'll hear us out, maybe you'll realize that you've, You've not just gone off the reservation. You're you're setting fires on the reservation. Um, anyways, um, is this is this reality, right? God, um, he just wants to. Um, he's just malicious. In Brian Zahn's, you know, retelling of penal substitution, because this isn't a debate where he's debating against penal substitution in particular. And he's in his retelling of it. He's like, yeah, God's like, how many thorns do I really want to see? Let's see how many. And it's like it's like a horror movie playing out. And the, the director is like, how many body parts and how much blood do we want to see here? And that's just a disgusting misrepresentation of, of the actual doctrine of the cross that he's actually fighting against. And it's embarrassing. Every time I hear that benediction in church, I get chill bumps. Because it so incorporates my highest dream to see his face. But my purpose this afternoon is not to explain the blessing of God, but it's polar opposite. It's antithesis, which again can be seen in vivid contrast to the benediction. It would be the supreme malediction that would read something like this. May the Lord curse you and abandon you. May the Lord keep you in darkness and give you only judgment without grace. May the Lord turn his back upon you and remove his peace from you forever. So, so Mike is saying that R.C. Sproul, 
all of these all of these other gentlemen that that have articulated this particular view of, of PSA that they affirm these are these are not uh, uh, men using rhetoric or strong arguments to um, criticize this view. They're telling you we affirm it. This is what it teaches. We believe it, and you and I come along and go. We have a problem here. But Mike is saying, no, 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 we're inventing this, that we're misrepresenting this, that that's not what PSA is all about. And it, it, with respect to Mike, I I think he is ignoring some of the unique distinctives of penal substitution and its claims, which we've done a series on previously, I noted in, in other episodes here, but there are 17 unique claims of penal substitutionary atonement. And we're not we're not inventing these. These are the claims that comprise PSA. And we've heard several of its adherents in, in today's program emphatically and enthusiastically echo those. So I, I don't think it would be fair to say that, that we're being dishonest or misrepresenting or not understanding. This is the doctrine. All we are doing is saying what they say. I mean, are we not allowed to notice what the atonement school says about the crucifixion of Christ? We're not misrepresenting a darn thing. If we want to talk about misrepresentation, misrepresentation would be saying that Athanasius taught PSA. If one wants to see the falsity of that, all one has to do is compare what Athanasius said about the crucifixion to what the atonement school says about the crucifixion. Well, Warren, I had fun looking at Athanasius with you. I hope next time we can do John Chrysostom. Now, John Chrysostom or Chrysostom, Chrysanthemum, I have I have the worst time pronouncing his last name, but I, I love uh, this John. And uh, and I always find um, uh, a beautiful, a beautiful articulation of a particular passage or a beautiful insight uh, from this uh, particular early church father. So I am uh, excited and uh, truly looking forward to this next episode. Uh, and thank you so much, Paul, for joining us. Thanks for walking us through it. And I cannot wait till the next episode. Please be sure to watch each episode in this series as we are responding to the claims Mike Winger put forward, addressing the historicity and biblical basis of penal substitutionary atonement. Thanks for watching.